I want to start with uh, the topic of longevity. The most important thing we can do, one of the most important things we can do to extend our lifespan is to keep our glucose and insulin levels as low as possible. The reason for that is uh, glucose, when levels are higher in the blood, we undergo a rate of glycation much faster than we normally would. And what is glycation? Glycation is simply the attachment of sugar to our protein molecules. 99% of our cellular function is carried out by proteins. Um, our proteins are absolutely critical to normal life processes within the cell. Well, proteins are very efficient molecules. They're very slippery, long-chain polypeptide molecules that are constantly mingling in the soup inside the cell or the cytoplasm. As they mingle, they bump into one another, they roll around one another, they bounce off one another, and they still get their jobs done, um, primarily because they're very slippery. If you ever tried to play catch with a raw oyster, you know what I'm talking about. Well, if you wanted to play catch with an oyster, how would you make that oyster sticky? Well, one thing you could do is put some molasses on it and put it in the oven for a few minutes. What you're doing is you're sugaring it. You're glycating it, the process of glycation. And that will make the oyster sticky and easy to grab onto. Well, all of us are glycating 100% of the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a normal, natural process, yet it's a detrimental process to life and therefore we want to glycate as little as possible. Since glycation is a passive process of the attachment of sugar to protein molecules, it stands to reason that the higher the blood sugar, the more we're going to glycate. The more sugar that the proteins are exposed to, the more they will attach to. So the higher the blood sugar, the more we glycate. Now, when proteins are glycated, they become sticky. They start to stick together within the cell and they work much less efficiently that starts to lead to cellular dysfunction, inflammation, uh, tissue inflammation, and it starts the process of degenerative disease. Things like atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, early heart attacks and strokes, inflammatory diseases, basically poor health that leads to degenerative disease. Now, what's wrong with degenerative disease? Well, obviously there are problems with degenerative disease, but um, our longevity is dependent on nothing else at, at this stage of medicine where we are now than the prevention of degenerative disease. People don't die of old age. People die of degenerative disease. Um, a 99-year-old lady who doesn't wake up in the nursing home one morning uh, didn't die of old age. She died of a disease. She probably ruptured an aneurysm during the night or she had a heart attack or a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. Something related to years of accumulation of degeneration, partly based on excess glycation and oxidative stress. So we get less glycation, and since glycation in causing proteins to stick together leads to oxidative stress, we age faster when we have high sugar levels. Uh, the other issue is <clears throat> high sugar levels lead to high insulin levels. As blood sugar goes up, we have to move that sugar from the blood into the cell. That's done by a hormone called insulin. The higher the blood sugar level, the more insulin we have to make. Um, as insulin levels rise in the, in the bloodstream, insulin also leads to degenerative disease because high insulin levels also cause oxidative stress. Um, if you look at the adult onset diabetic, they are a model for rapid aging because they have both high blood sugar and high insulin levels. And long before the rest of us, non-diabetics, get these diseases, they get diseases such as atherosclerosis, abnormal cholesterol profile, high blood pressure, central accumulation of body fat or central obesity, peripheral neuropathy, kidney disease, and retinal disease, which can lead to blindness. So even as non-diabetics, we can slow down the aging process and extend our productive, useful lifespan by keeping sugar and insulin levels as low as possible. What happens with a diabetic is he has insulin resistance, the adult onset diabetic. He's had high sugar for so long and high insulin levels for so long that his cells no longer respond to the insulin as efficiently as they should. It's very much like if you had, if you had to live next to the railroad tracks and you heard the train day in and day out, eventually you'd tune the train out and your friends would come over and say, my God, what's that noise? And you'd say, what noise? Well, when we have constant high insulin levels, our cells begin to pull in their receptors to insulin 
and they stop responding to insulin or they decrease their response to insulin. So we develop a, a problem called insulin resistance. Now this happens in diabetics and non-diabetics. The difference is um, in order to develop adult onset diabetes, your insulin resistance increases and increases and increases to the point that your pancreas can't make enough insulin to compensate for it. As we become more insulin resistant, the pancreas reacts by making more insulin. So higher insulin levels then are necessary to get the cells to pull sugar in from the blood into the cell. As that insulin level gets higher and higher, we get more and more insulin resistant. So the pancreas compensates by making more and more insulin. At some point, the pancreas can't make any more insulin. So you have high sugar, very high insulin, and now you develop insulin resistance so that insulin you have isn't enough to bring the sugar from the blood into the cell and the sugar levels go too high and now you're a diabetic. But it's not only sugar, you're going to find that there are a large number of foods that increase blood sugar rapidly and dramatically that aren't even sweet. And that's part of the keys to this little lesson here is to learn what foods those are. Because you cannot eat sweets and still run very high blood sugars by virtue of eating a lot of high glycemic foods. Just to summarize briefly, the, one of the main keys to longevity is keeping glucose and insulin levels low by by the result of preventing degenerative disease. Now, when we talk about sugar and insulin levels, there are three foods on the planet to eat, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. When we talk about glucose and insulin, we're talking primarily about carbohydrates, because proteins and fats, relatively speaking, have very little effect on blood sugar. Now, carbohydrates come in various forms, and not all carbohydrates are created equal. Um, no matter what carbohydrate you eat, however, it's absorbed into the blood as glucose or sugar. That's true if you eat a bowl of sugar or if you eat a bowl of broccoli. The difference is how quickly that happens. If you eat a bowl of sugar, it happens instantly. Before you even swallow the sugar, your blood sugar is going up because it's absorbed from your mouth, from under your tongue. Um, very rapidly, your sugar levels go way up, and that requires the pancreas to make a large amount of insulin. If you eat a bowl of broccoli, it has to be digested, the cellulose has to be broken down, the digestible carbohydrate has to be separated from the non-digestible fiber, and it's a long, slow process. Blood sugar goes up very slowly and gradually over about two hours, which allows insulin levels to climb very slowly and gradually over about two hours. Tremendous difference in the health consequences. Okay, one is causing high blood sugar, high insulin, rapid glycation, excess glycation, high insulin levels, more oxidative stress, more degenerative disease, day after day, week after week, year after year. Probably makes a difference of about 10 to 15 years in lifespan between the person, non-diabetics now, who eats a poor diet and doesn't exercise versus the person that eats a low glycemic diet and exercises. That's just my opinion. I don't have data to back that 10 or 15 years statement up, but I feel very strongly about it. You with me so far? Sure am. Okay, so um, now we want to talk about what insulin is and what it does. I, I talked about the consequences of high insulin. Insulin is our fuel injector. When we eat carbohydrates, we put the carbohydrates into our gastrointestinal system, absorb it into the bloodstream, and the sugar does us no good in the bloodstream. It's useless. In order to burn that sugar for fuel, we need to get it into our cells. Very much like when you put gasoline in your car, you put it in the tank doesn't push the car until you get it into the cylinder. So you have a fuel injector to move the gas from the tank into the cylinder where it combusts to move the car. Insulin is our fuel injector. It moves sugar from the blood into the cell where we actually combust it. We send it down a chain of reactions to burn it, so to speak, and extract the energy. Now, let's look at um, a cell and look at how insulin affects the cell. Here's a cell with its insulin receptor. All cells have receptor sites that proteins, hormones, and other molecules, even drugs, can hook onto to affect the cell. So here's a cell. Here's a blood vessel going by. And that blood vessel has glucose in it. It has blood, and there's sugar in the blood in the form of glucose. Here's an insulin molecule. Now, what insulin does, it attaches to the receptor site. 
and insulin is now affecting the cell. The first thing it does is it opens up a channel to bring glucose into the cell. So the glucose enters the cell, and now it's sent down a chain of reactions to extract the energy, to burn it, so to speak. And if this is a kidney cell, it uses that energy to do kidney things. Liver cell, liver things. If it's a muscle cell, it uses it to contract. Okay? If it's a fat cell, it doesn't burn the sugar. It converts it to fat, because that's its job. Fat cell is an energy storage depot, and its job is to take the energy from glucose, convert it to fat, and store it for a rainy day. So, what it does is it converts that glucose to fat, packs it up against the wall to make room for more. Now, in between meals, when sugar is low, we're supposed to move that fat back into the blood to restore the energy available to our other cells. So, what we'll do is we'll turn that fat into a little tiny product, a molecule called free fatty acids, which are then delivered back into the bloodstream as energy molecules that our other cells, kidney cells, liver cells, muscle cells, can pick up and burn for energy just like they would burn sugar. Different metabolic pathway, but energy nonetheless. With me? Okay. So, unfortunately, the other effect that insulin has on our cells is to block this process of converting fat to free fatty acids. So insulin prevents us from utilizing our body fat. Now, why would we have a hormone that would block that very important process? Because insulin is balanced with other hormones that promote fat burning, that promote fat breakdown, particularly glucagon, but also growth hormone and male hormones like testosterone promote fat burning. So the problem with this is between meals, if our insulin levels are still high, we can't get at our body fat and we become tired, weak, and hungry. And if you're a typical red-blooded American, you eat more, right? So the problem begets more of the same problem. Let's look at how this scenario affects your day. We'll put a graph here of blood glucose and insulin levels versus time of day. And here we'll have a meal. Now, let's say uh, this is breakfast, and for breakfast we're going to have a bowl of cereal with a banana, um, a cup of sweetened blueberry yogurt, a glass of orange juice, a cup of coffee. Okay? That's what I would call a high glycemic breakfast. Typical American breakfast considered healthy, very high glycemic. The result of that is for blood glucose levels, or blood sugar levels, glucose and sugar are synonymous, go screaming up. Okay? That requires the pancreas to make a whole bunch of insulin because too much sugar in the blood will make us sick. We've got to move that sugar from the blood into the cells. And that's insulin's job, our fuel injector. So the pancreas makes a whole bunch of insulin and insulin levels go screaming up. Now we've got high insulin and high glucose. All of a sudden, all our cells open these channels for sugar because of the tremendous insulin effect. And all the glucose rushes into the cells. The result, the blood glucose plummets because the sugar's moved into the cells. So at this point, the pancreas can say, well, I can take a break. The blood sugar's down. I can stop making insulin. But insulin is a long-chain polypeptide hormone. It doesn't go away quickly. It has to be metabolized, and its levels in the blood drop very slowly. So insulin levels drop more on this curve. Okay. So at this point in time, we have low sugar, normal low, not too low, not pathologic, and high insulin. The problem with that is, at the time when we have very little sugar left in the bloodstream, insulin is still around, it's still attached to our fat cells, and we can't break down fat into free fatty acids. 